So one of the big ideas that you have in the book, you're going back to the different themes that you extracted, uh, is this idea of colonial dissonance. And I think many of us in the audience probably have heard of the term cognitive dissonance, which is, you know, some kind of mental conflict that you have when your beliefs don't line up with your actions. But you've kind of drawn on that idea to coin this term colonial dissonance as a really core idea that you're advancing how does that relate to this issue of economic relationships that, and relations that we're talking about today? Yeah, yeah. And so in the interviews, uh, one of the fellows I interviewed, Sunny, a, a Cree knowledge holder, uh, language teacher, and he talked about... Um, he talked about how uh, he would he holds a lodge, uh, so a sweat ceremony, and 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 in the prairies where I live, um, there's a lot of resource extraction. And he, he would talk about um, uh, 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 people coming into a sweat, uh, men that uh, worked in the oil and gas extractive industry, and so they would come in. And he said that oftentimes they would be uh, going through the ceremony and, and praying and just also reflecting after about how they have these knowledge and teachings about relationships with land and each other. And then they feel this uh, dissonance um, with, with the work that they do and, and the work that they have to do to put food on the table for their family. And so, um, you know, we can talk about, as you mentioned, cognitive dissonance, but, but just thinking about this term, um, uh, uh, colonial dissonance and how for Indigenous peoples that um, in, in the world that we live in today, oftentimes it's more than cognition, it affects all of us. So mm -hmm. that means spiritually, um, emotionally, uh, physically, and, and mentally. And so, uh, yeah, it's um, that we live in this colonial dissonance of being taught and having these certain values and, and then living in a world where we can't uh, fully express them. And so even something as simple as, you know, if I really believe in, in, in a wanting to have a more subsistence livelihood for my community, that's not even possible in the lands I live in anymore because of um, like settlement and and not having the animals and resources and also pollution. So so um, the thing also with colonial dissonance and economic economic exploitation is it also limits the opportunities for self determination for ways that Indigenous people can be reconciled with uh, Canadians. Right. Uh, it's a very powerful term that I think is going to be very useful for many people in talking about how we move forward on, on reconciliation. In the book, uh, you write, in this book, I explore how an understanding of a livelihood economic model might enable the social, political, economic, legal, and cultural reproduction of our people while upholding our relationships to all living beings. And I think it connects to the point that you made before, where it's not just things are cognitive, but there's spirit, there's all kinds of other things. Um, I wanted to ask kind of two questions about that. One is this emphasis on the livelihood economic model. And then second, why do you have social, political, legal, and cultural reproduction along with economic reproduction in a livelihood economic model? Why so many dimensions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so one of the things is is my uncle, um, who's actually staying with me right now, Winston Whitney, he, he shared with me, I asked him, 20 some years ago, uncle, what does self-determination mean in Cree? What's the Cree word for it? And he said, uh, nehiau aski. Uh, nehiau um, is Cree, means Cree person. Uh, nehiau is Cree people. And, and, and that's from the root word neo, which is the word for fro, four, which means that we're the four spirited people. And he said aski as self-determination of the land. And so what that means for him, self-determination means that we have roles and responsibilities for um, the animals, for uh, for relationships with the water, with the land, with each other. And so, part of self-determination then in this in this view of how Cree people can be self-determining on on these lands is is to live in that self-determination. And so those roles and responsibilities and also relationships inform how we do livelihood. And and there's principles of how livelihood happened historically that are still relevant for today. And so keeping that in mind and then those um 
Elder Elmer Ghostkeeper, he wrote this book, uh, Spirit Gifting. And mm -hmm. so he is is from Alberta here. And one of the things he talks about is how how um, all societies have four aspects, social, cultural, political, economic. And then um, I did a lot of work with with uh, a partnership with um, law recently. And so we were talking about how, how law is often a part of that too and, and legal processes historically and today. And so oftentimes with the economy today and how we think about it, you know, maximum profit, um, maximum profit for shareholders um, and, and kind of insatiable greed that we can have, uh, when, when in capitalism and the world we live in, um, oftentimes in the economy, in the way we talk about economic development, we prioritize the economic sphere above all the other spheres of society. And so in this livelihood model, it's talking about how all aspects of society are important and we have to not, um, not create an imbalance by put prioritizing one over the others.